Hello and welcome to another session, a live stream for Physics 212, that's Physics with Calculus. We're talking about um, capacitors, D circuits, Ohm's Law, and other fun things like that this week. So let's jump in and get started right away. Um, real quick, I do want to post a few links in the chat. So there's a, a <coughs> link to the Learning Center's website, their Facebook and Instagram, so follow them on Facebook and Inst Instagram to get updates regularly, and I'll post a link to the attendance sheet for this course, and we'll jump into capacitance. Mm. So I like the capacitors are, capacitance is basically where we have two charged plates that are kind of opposite each other creating a uniform electric field inside of it. As we know from previously, we know that the electric field from a charged plate is going to equal epsilon minus, or sorry, the charge density divided by 2 epsilon naught. <clears throat> and that's going to be true for all charged plates. Now, once you get inside in between those two charged plates, like somewhere inside here, we can say that this is equal to kind of <coughs> twice that value because um, the electric field from the positive side is going to add on to the electric field from the negative side. We end up with double that. The two on the denominator are essentially canceled out at that point. And we're inside there, it's going to equal the charge density divided by a blood knot. Now, Outside a capacitor, in this case, we have two charged um, two charged plates. We're actually going to have a subtraction of those values because this guy is say coming from the charge plate because this guy is emitting radiating electric field outwards, but the negative side would be pulling back inwards. So outside of the plates, those they subtract from each other, but inside between those plates, they add up to each other. So this has a net electric field of zero. <clears throat> and we can calculate the units for capacitance in what we call farad, which is equal to the charge per voltage. So these uh, charge plates will build up a certain level of charge or charge density, charge per area. And depending on the voltage that we applied to them, we can define them as certain farad. We can calculate a good expression for capacitance is equal then to charge over V, like Q over V. And we could also see that as, not really equal to, but it leads us to the equation CV is equal to Q. So we can solve for the charge if we know the capacitance and voltage. We can solve for the capacitance if we know the charge and the voltage. Mm. Using the voltage potential that we've had previously, this idea that the voltage is equal to the electric field times the distance, we can see, and substituting that into the, this previous equation, we have capacitance is equal to the charge divided by ED. So that electric field, as we defined here, is the charge density, or I guess, as we defined up here, is the charge density divided by epsilon naught, which is equal, basically, to the charge per area, epsilon naught. <clears throat> so substituting this guy in for the electric field, that's going to be the capacitance is equal to, we have... Q over, and I'm substituting it in for the electric field, so that's basically Q over A, epsilon naught, times distance, the distance between them. And notice my Qs are going to cancel out, and all of this is going to flip up onto the top. So now I have the area times epsilon naught divided by distance. And this is how we define capacitance, where the this is the area of the charge plate, and 
And this is the distance between plates. <clears throat> and that's the main equation we can use for the capacitance of things. <clears throat> we can also talk about dielectrics, which we'll get into a little bit later. But we, <clears throat> once we saw earlier that if we can charge these capacitors, these capacitors can have a potential energy. That potential energy we, is equal to half the capacitance times the voltage squared. We can do a little bit of substitution using other equations. We can also see that's equal to half the charge times voltage or equal to charge over to capacitance. So all of those are ways to calculate the potential energy. And you want to pick the right equation to fit the values you have. Otherwise, it ends up basically a system of equation. But all of these are just manipulations of the same basic idea. <clears throat> so let's move on. Let's talk about dielectrics. So a dielectric, basically, zooming in here, <clears throat> we're adding these dipoles, this material that can, is consists of dipoles in between there, which essentially counteracts the electric field going between these plates. Okay. So I can define this as a dielectric is a polarized molecule whose electric field counters the electric field of the capacitor plates. And the effect that this has here is the voltage between the plates is then reduced, meaning that there's a smaller voltage potential for the same charge. And so as the electric field in between the plate that's reduced, the voltage potential between those plates is also smaller. And looking at our capacitance equation, C is equal to Q over V, we can see that if, if voltage is decreased, the capacitance will increase. So as V goes up, C goes down. As V goes as V goes down, C will go up. That's really the key part of it. And they're inversely proportional is the key. We can calculate the effect that a dielectric will have on there because the dielectric basically has a proportional effect to the capacitor. So we can say that C is equal to K times the area, K being the dielectric constant over the distance. So all I'm taking, I'm just using the same equation that we coined over here, and I'm throwing this dielectric constant now in front of it. It's this guy. And the dielectric constant of air is equal to one. So all other dielectric, all dipoles you put in between the capacitor is going to be greater than one. Common values are something like five to seven or something like that. <clears throat> but they can change drastically and depending on the dielectric constant, you can control the capacitance essentially. So using not just the area of the plates, but also the gap between those plates and, and the material you put in between those plates, we can change the capacitance quite a bit. So let's look at some problems. Oh yeah, let's talk about how to use capacitors first. So if we had capacitors, we could line them up into circuits in two different ways. We have them either in parallel or series. And what we mean by that is if I draw power source, 
and then I can have some circuit. I can draw capacitors. That's the symbol for a capacitor right there. I can draw a few of them kind of in parallel. Like that. This over here not being a capacitor, being actual voltage supply here. So I can say this is C1, this is C2, and this is C3. And when we add up the capacitance of parallel capacitors, uh, it's no it's interesting to note that the same voltage here, the voltage potential between any of the points is going to be the same. So if I put a voltmeter and I wired it in there, it's going to have the same voltage across all of these points because this whole line is connected. There's no additional resistance between there to cause that voltage to drop. So the charge of each capacitance or the charge of the total capacitance can be calculated just by adding up those values in this case. So I can say C total is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. That's for parallel capacitors. Series capacitors work a little bit different. For series capacitors, we're going to have... Draw them there. So these capacitors are in series being that the positive voltage supply is here, and I have a C1, a C2, and a C3. To add up these values, we actually have to take the reciprocal of the, the total is equal to the summation of the reciprocal of each capacitor value, C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. The way I like to calculate this is to say that the C total is equal to the, the same 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3, and then take that whole result to the negative 1 power, because that just flipped it. So you're basically flipping the 1 over C1. But just putting some parentheses on your calculator and throwing it to the negative 1 power gives you the reciprocal of it, and that gives you the total capacitance or any capacitors laid out in series. So we're going to try to apply this now in this example here. So you have to find the capacitance of the circuit below. You can see we have three capacitors here. In this case, it's not like the loop that I had here where the voltage supply is here. In, in this case, our power is going to be coming from one side. I can kind of connect them through like this. And we're going to have some power supply some power supply being in the middle. So we actually have these two are in series with each other, but they're in parallel with this guy. So we can, we can first sum up the two that are in series, and then we can use that to sum up the the all three, three of them combined. So if I called, say, this one C1, this one C2, this one C3, we can say that the capacitance of 1 and 2 is equal to, or we can just, 0 0.3 UF plus 10 UF. Oh, I'm sorry, I did that backwards. should be equal to 1 over 0 0.3 UF plus 1 over 10 UF. the inverse and that should give us the total capacitance of that, that side of the circuit so let's calculate that I'm gonna hop over to my calculator wherever it is Here's a new calculator I'm gonna say 1 divided by 0.3 times 10 to the negative 6 fed we're gonna add that to 1 divided by 10 times 10 to negative 6. Good. And put parentheses over the whole thing and take it to the power of negative 1. And that gives me 2.9 times 10 to the negative 7. Good. 
So that's equal to 2.9 times 10 to the negative 7 farad. And we, we can convert that to microfarad because that's what we were using. That's just going to be 0 0.29 microfarad. But that's just this side over here. So we have to need to add it up and sum it up to this side over here. And since those two are in parallel, we can just add our new combined capacitance with the capacitance of the other one. So I can say C total now is equal to 2.5 microfarad plus 0.29 microfarad, which is going to be equal to 2.79 microfarad and that's the total capacitance of this circuit so this is a good example of how to add capacitors in series and then add them in parallel and often in a circuit you're going to have a lot of different combinations of things so you just systematically work through build up the capacitance you can you could have these two in series you add those together and then add it to a parallel and this could just be one small segment of a much larger circuit but the same basic rules apply. It's just a systematic kind of process on how to calculate these capacitors. Here's, here's another problem we have. This says, what is the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor having plates uh, with an area of 2 square meters that are separated by 0 0.014 millimeters of neoprene rubber? And it gives us I electric constant, this one. So. We had talked about the equation here, which was kappa A epsilon naught over D. And we know that, that kappa is equal to 6.7. Our area is equal to 2 meters squared. And the distance is equal to 0 0.014 millimeters right and I'm, I can write that that's just 0 0.014 times 10 to the negative 3 meters to convert everything to standard units because all of for this all work it needs to be in standard units usually or at least the same units so plugging in these values now I can say that the capacitance is equal to 6.7 times 2 meters squared times epsilon naught, which is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. Units on that is farad per meter. So that's just one of many units for it. Divide that whole, whole thing by 0 0.04 times 10 to negative 3 meters. Could be a 0 0.14 in there. We can plug that into our calculator. That's 6.7 times 2 meters squared times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th units of farad per meter. And divide that whole thing by 0 0.014 times 10 to negative 3 meters. That looks right. We've got a very small number. We've got 8.5 times 10 to the 6 farad. So that's equal to 8.5 times 10 to the negative 6, which is micro Farad. So that is going to be the capacitance of this capacitor. So it's really just an application of this formula and making sure that you can plug it in your values. It's important to be able to pull those the correct values out of the problem itself and plug them into the formula. And then it asks what charge does it hold when 8.5 volts is applied to it. So we can use a different formula here which is just C is equal to Q over V, All right? So now we know the capacitance. The capacitance we had was 8.5 microfarad. So if I say it's 8.5 microfarad is equal to Q 
divided by uh, 8.5 volts. So we can just multiply those two together, actually. Multiply by 8.5 volts on either side, and we get 8.5 microfarad times 8.5 volts is equal to the charge. So we'll take that, multiply it by 8.5 volts, and we get an answer in coulombs, which is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 5 coulombs. 7.2 times 10 to the negative 5 coulombs. so much charge that's actually built up on the capacitor plates themselves. And we compare that charge to a case with no, no dielectric present. So to do that, we kind of have to go back to what we did here previously. See, we used this equation here. We had 6.7 in there for capacitance, or for the dielectric constant. So going forward, if I have the capacitance with the dielectric, which is equal to K A epsilon naught over D, right? And I have the capacitance with air. This is equal to the same thing. And the only difference between these two capacitors is a change in cap, or change in K. This is equal here. Here to, was it 6.7 and this one over here is equal to 1 because cap of air is equal to 1. Ooh, taking the um, ratio of these two we can plug in is basically CD over oops, C air was equal to in this case 6.7 times the area times epsilon naught divided by by the distance, divide that whole thing by 1 times the area times epsilon naught, naught divided by the distance. That's a D up there. And notice these are all the same values. They all get cancelled out. This is equal to 6.7. So the ratio of capacitance is proportional to the, or it's equal to the dielectric constant. That's how they find these dielectric constants. They put different materials in there and they can calculate the difference. So now we have this problem here, where this capacitor made up of two concentric circles, or two concentric spheres, one with a radius of 5.8 centimeters and the other with a radius of 7.2 centimeters. We want to know the capacitance of the set of co conductors. In this case, we can find that capacitance using this equation, 4 pi, oops, 4 pi epsilon naught. That's a dielectric constant times R1 times R2 divided by the difference between R2 minus R1. And in this case, R1 is equal to the radius of the inner sphere. We have R2 equal to the radius of the outer sphere. And epsilon naught, of course, is the permittivity of free space, and <coughs> we all know what pi is, k is the dielectric constant. So up here, they tell us the radiuses here and here. So they don't tell us any value for k, so we're going to use air, just the k of 1, and we can find the capacitance. C is equal to 4 pi times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 farad per meter times 1 being the k for air. And then we multiply the two radiuses together. I'm going to convert them to meters. This is times 0 0.072 meters divided by the difference.
difference 0 0.072 minus 0 0.058 meters. Plugging this in, we get 4 pi times 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 fed per meter. And we're going to multiply that times 0 0.058 meters. Multiply that by 0 0.072 meters. Divide by the difference between them, 0 0.072 meters minus 0 0.058 and that's going to equal 3.3 times 10 to the negative 11 which is equal to 3.3 times 10 to the negative 11 fed and that's about 0 0.033 nanofarad. So that's going to be the capacitance between two concentric spheres. And they'll make capacitors not just in kind of like in plates. You can see capacitance in spheres. You can see it in like coaxial cable that you have flowing through your house that brings cable television to your house or something like that. There's basically an inner wire. There's some shielding and outer wire and the capacitance between those two. So we can ask ourselves if the region between the conductors is filled with a material whose dielectric constant is 5.7, what is the capacitance of the system? Right? So the same thing, the only thing that changes here is we're adding 5.7 in here, right? And this value here, the K is changing. So we can use that same number that the C uh, with the dielectric is going to be equal to the capacitance of air times 5.7. So all we have to do is multiply th this last number we had by 5.7. Put an extra thing in there. And we get 1.89 times 10 to the negative 10. Equal to 1.89 times 10 to the negative 10 farad, which is about nanofarad. <clears throat> so all we did was move that decimal place over one so we, we can get into the times 10 to the negative 9 range. We get a common nanofarad, which is a standard a scale of normal um, capacitors. So let's go on to talk a little bit about current now. We can find current which is equal to the change in charge to the change in time. Okay, we me measure current in amperes or amps, which is the unit for it, and that's basically equal to our coulombs over seconds. The charge per second is what we're looking at. And if we were to draw a circuit for this, just draw a basic, put a resistor in there. positive charge over there. We can call the current as, we used to call it flowing from the positive side to negative side. It's usually a positive current. It's actually the opposite direction of the flow of the, the electrons. Because oftentimes that current is, char is created by electrons kind of moving in the opposite direction from the negative side to the positive side. So, the electron flow is opposite of the current flow. We can also define current, say I is equal to the number of electrons time or divided by time. Here N is the equals the number of electrons. E is equal to the charge of all the electrons, or not 
all the electrons, each electron. And T is the photon. We also define it based on the velocity, the speed of which those electrons are moving through the circuit. We call that the drift velocity. Those electrons don't fly through the circuit at near light speed. They actually kind of meander through the circuit kind of slowly, relativistically. So if I were to draw a basic wire, we would see electrons kind of bouncing around, working their way kind of slowly towards the other end. And we can define that current, again, based off of the number of electrons times this, the cross-sectional area. So if I were to take a cross-section of this, it would be a circle. In this case, if we had a square wire, our cross-section would be a square, and we can calculate the area based on that. If it was just a triangular, et cetera, et cetera. So whatever cross-sectional area you have, you want to take that area and put it in there. And we would call it drift velocity. And we can discover this drift velocity. If we knew the current, we could then go back and find out how fast those electrons are moving through there. So that's the basic idea of current. Um, we'll go on to a little bit about resistivity. We're going to use some of these to solve some problems here in a second. So the resistivity of a circuit or of an object in general, that R is going to be equal to this value rho, which is a kind of a resistivity constant. It's going to be different for every type of material, and it does change also based on uh, the temperature as well. So, rho times the length of the current divided by the cross-sectional area of that current. Okay, so again, rho is the, it looks like a weird D. Rho is equal to resistivity. L is equal to length of the wire or whatever conductive material you have, and A is equal to the cross-section. of the wire. And like I said, it's temperature dependent. So if we're changing temperatures, it's going from like a hot to a cold thing, we can define that resistivity is equal to the initial resistivity, or the resistance is equal to resistivity divided by L or multiplied by L divided by A times 1 plus some value alpha delta T. And that's the change in temperature there. Okay, and we can say that's equal to the initial rho naught, or resi the, the initial resistance times 1 plus alpha delta T. So that's a way to calculate the resistivity. They use this type of metal or uh, technology in some of the digital thermometers and stuff like that they have because they have a little piece of tungsten or other types of metal in there which changes length or change has some change in resistivity based on the temperature. So as the temperature increases and changes, they're able to measure that resistance change and, and um, equate that to the temperature change that's happened there. And this will lead us on to to Ohm's law, and Ohm's law, we have to talk about resistance and capacitance and, and amperage just so we can get to this point of Ohm's law, because Ohm's law is basically uh, the relationship between all of these things, and you can define Ohm's law as the resistance, which is measured in a unit of ohms where one ohm is equal to a, a circuit U -I -T with one volt, an L in there, carrying one amp. Or you can see it written out as an equation, R is equal to V over I, 
which is equal to 1 ohm. And then we use that capital omega to simulate ohms. <clears throat> it's commonly written, or I like to remember it, is V is equal to IR. And notice that <clears throat> it's a, a lot, there's lots of different ways to rewrite this. You can also write it as I is equal to V over R. And it's these relationships where the resistance is um, directly proportional to the voltage, or the um, voltage is directly proportional to the current. For example, the current is indirectly proportional to, or inversely proportional to the resistance. So depending on what values we have, we can then solve for the other ones. And sometimes you can increase the voltage, would increase the current, as long as the resistance stayed the same. If you increase the resistance, the current's gonna drop because you um, are allowing less current to go through there. If you increase the voltage, the current's going up and so on. So we can use this basic relationship to define and calculate a lot of things a lot easier than trying to calculate you know, the flow of electrons through the stuff. So here's a question here on resistivity. To what temperature must you raise a copper wire originally at 23 degrees Celsius to double its resistance? Neglecting any change of dimension. Because as it changes temperature, it could possibly change slightly. And we're using value here for alpha or A. So using that equation I had, where the resistance after the temperature change is equal to some initial resistance, 1 plus A delta T. In this case, we want to know to double its resistance. So we don't know what the initial re resistance was, but we do know the fi final resistance wants to double the in initial resistance. So I can say R is equal to 2R0. Substituting that value in, I'll say 2R0 is equal to R0 times 1 plus A delta T. Notice my r naughts will cancel now because it doesn't really matter what that initial resistance is. What matters is this relationship needs to equal 2. So finding that out, 2, I'm going to plug in my value for alpha now. 2 is equal to 1 plus 3.9 times 10 to the negative 3. And this is going to be 1 over coulombs and times our delta t. We can rearrange the equation a bit. We can subtract 1 from either side. So that's going to be 2 minus 1. It's just going to equal 1. And that cancels this off this side. We can then divide by this 3.9, that a value. So I can divide by 3.9 times 10 to negative 3 per coulomb. It actually pulls that coulomb up to the top. I guess that's Celsius here, isn't it? I keep saying cool. But that's temperature Celsius because our temperature is degrees Celsius. Let me put a little degree symbol there so I don't screw that up again. Now we have that equaling our change in temperature. Now our change in temperature is going to equal the temperature final minus the temperature initial. We know the original temperature is 29 or sorry 23 degrees celsius so that's going to equal t final minus 23 degrees c so now i can rewrite that as 1 over 3.9 times 10 to negative 3 this is in degrees c that's going to equal t final minus 23 degrees C. I can add 23 degrees C to both sides. So that's 23 degrees C plus 1 over 3.9 times 10 to the negative 3 degrees C, which is equal to the final temperature. So if you plug that into our calculator, that's 1 divided by 3.9 times 10 to the negative 3 but my I'm going to leave the degrees off plus 23 degrees 
is equal to 279.41. So, equal to 279.4 degrees C. So, that's going to be the temperature change based off of the change in resistance, that doubling of resistance up there. And we ask, does this happen in household wiring under any ordinary circumstances? Now, household wiring can get pretty hot, but 279 degrees is a lot hotter than I would want my household wiring to get. So I wouldn't hope that it doesn't happen. The only time I would expect it to happen is like if your house is burning down. But most likely, if the current going through the wire is getting uh, close to hot enough, as it approaches that temperature, probably way before it gets to that temperature, your circuit breaker is going to blow, you're going to blow a fuse, and it'll be set and start to cool down again. So I would answer this as no. And more likely, now if we look at the change dimensions, most of the time the wire is going to stretch or it's going to shrink in radius, and we're actually going to get a small resistance based off of a deformation of the wire itself before you actually get to the point where uh, it's re reaching anything near this temperature to double the re resistance there. Now we want to find the voltage drop in an extension cord having 0 0.075 ohms resistance through which 4.5 amps is flowing. So this is a basic application ohms law. This V equals IR. I wrote it backwards. Let's write it correctly. Well, it doesn't really matter which way, but we have the amperage, we have the resistance, so we have I, we have R, we just need to find V, so that means the voltage is going to be equal to 4.5 amps times 0 0.075 ohms. And plugging that into our calculator. 4.5 amps times 0 0.075 ohms going to be equal to 0.3375 volts. That's equal to 0 0.3375 volts, which you can write it as 338 of a volt. So it's a cheaper cord in this case, which is a thinner wire, but it has a higher resistance because of that, that thin wire. Because the voltage drop up and 4.5 amps flows through there. So same equation, V is equal to IR, produces a voltage which is equal to 4.5 amps times 0.0, and in this case 0.15 ohms. Bring that guy into our calculator. <laughs> we get 0 0.675 volts. So the voltage has increased. And this is the voltage um, of the circuit itself. It's the voltage drop because of the resistance. As the vo voltage is going through here, that current, if we started out with, with say, 120 volts in the wall at the end of that extension cord we would have in this case 0 0.675 volts less at the end of that extension cord because of the resistance of the cord itself so there's a slight voltage drop and if we had a much longer cord we would have a greater resistance and therefore a larger voltage drop and you'll see this calculated in um, a lot of the circuitry in your house electricians the electricity coming to your um, power like the circuit breaker is about 125 plus or minus maybe even up to 130 volts AD and then as they distribute the wires out if they have to go way to the other side of the house they don't want to meander their way slowly around so you got this really long path to get there they put a straight wire as short as they can out to the far distance there and the higher the voltage they are the lower the voltage drop is going to be 
But in this case, you can see the difference in the voltage drops there. And this would be 675 millivolts. Convert it in the same units. So looking at those cords, we can find the power dissipated from each of those cords. So remember that power is equal to IV, the current times the voltage. And that power is usually has the units of watts or joules per second. So that's energy per second goes through there. So using this power times IV and our Ohm's law, which is V equals IR, we can then find out the power, which is equal to I times IR, which is equal to I squared R. And we can use that expression there where the power is looks at the square of the current times the resistance. So using, oops, that's an R, I want it to be a P, that power, that 4.5 amps, but now we're squaring it. And for the first chord, chord one, we're going to have 0 0.075 ohms. We can find out what that will be. So that's 4.5 amps all squared times 0 0.075 in ohms. That's 1.519 watts. 1.5. 519 watts. So that's the amount of power that's dissipated in through the wire. The power that we don't get to use at our sur at the source itself. Looking cord two, the power consumption is going to be equal to the same 4.5 amps squared. But now we're multiplying it by the resistance of this wire, and we'll see. It's 3.04 watts. 3.04 watts. So notice we have about double the resistance. So we have about double the power going through there. And remember that watts is in joules per second. So that's the energy per second that's dissipated from it. So if we cost twice as much power or twice as much money to buy the more expensive cord you're going to actually use twice as much energy you're going to lose twice as much energy because of that cord so if you're going to use that cord constantly eventually it's going to end up costing more money so buy the more expensive cord another problem we have a coffee maker which has the resistance of 14 ohms and draws current of 13 amps. They want to know how much power does it use. So similarly, we have the V equals IR. And we can also utilize that P is equal to IV. In this case, we have, have ohms and we have amps. Right? So just like before, we want the resistance and the um, amperage. So I can say P is going to be equal to I squared R. And I should note that you could also rewrite this V over R equals I. And then plug in here for that. So power could also be equal to V squared over R. But in this case, we don't have voltage. So if we had the voltage, this, this would be a better way to do it. Since we have the current, we want to look at it over here. And it's all just a different way to write these two formulas together. So moving on, I have power is equal to, I have 13 amp circuit, or 13 amps. I'm squaring that times that 14 ohms. So I can multiply those together. times 14 ohms. It's really a small resistance for a coffee pot. So that's 2,366, 2,366 watts. 
That's 2,366 watts. And that's how much power is used by your coffee pot to make the coffee. If it has 14 ohms of resistance and 13 amps of power it uses. Now we have a toaster. So we did a coffee pot. We're going to do a toaster now with a 1400 watt toaster. How, how much does it cost to make a slice of toast with cooking time of 1.5 minutes? And in this case, electricity costs 5 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is cool. We have the power, right? And we have the time. We want to find the cost with that conversion. So if we know that watts is equal to that power, which is equal to work per time in joules per second, we can say then that 1400 watts times 1.5 minutes. And I'll convert that to seconds. So I do 60 seconds per minute convert that I'm going to equal that 1400 watts and 90 seconds so that's to find out how much energy we're using in that time frame so that 1400 watts times 90 seconds is equal to 126,000 joules 126 kilojoules that's 126 kilojoules. Now, we are being charged 5 cents per kilowatt hour. So we can convert that kilowatt hour in terms of joules. Because a kilowatt hour is basically per joule is going to be kilowatt hour divided by a thousand joules per second. Remember, a kilowatt is joules per second, but then we're going to be multiplying that, that by 3,600 seconds. Because that's how many seconds there are in an hour. So we just got 60 times 60, 60 minutes times 60 seconds gives us 3,600 3, seconds. So that's kind of our conversion rate there. I can take that 126 times 10 to the 3 joules. That's kilojoules. I can multiply that times my kilowatt hours divided by. If I multiply these two values together, we ended up getting three. Add three zeros, so three point six times ten to the six joules, and that would be yeah, because the seconds here is going to cancel out the hours up there. And we multiply that in by 5 cents per kilowatt hour. I'm sorry, the second there doesn't count. I'll fill that out. It cancels this out over here. That's seconds. So we always kilowatt hour to cancel out with that one. And this joule to cancel out with that one. Unit analysis is now happy. I have a value that's going to be in cents. Giving me an amount of money that it you, takes to do this, to spend that many joules there. So let's do that calculation. Um, say 126 times 10 to the third joules. I'm going to leave the units off because I've already canceled them out. Over 1 per 3 times 10 to the six. That should be 3.6 times to the 6. And 5 cents per hour, or for per kilowatt hour, should bring us to 0 0.175 cents. So to make, in this case, probably two slices of toast, because I make my toast two at a time, it costs 0 0.175 cents. That's the cost of making toast in the morning. It's pretty cheap power. And our time is up at the moment, so make sure to check out and, and um, check out the Learning Center's websites. 
if you have any questions on this drop in on the drop in tutoring hours in Pinji or make an appointment you should be able to get an appointment if you're watching this in Pinji with the link above my head uh if not definitely go to Pinji, make an account and, and sign up for tutoring if you have any questions uh i'll see you next week and enjoy